Welcome to Bonnie's Beat. I'm your host, Bonnie Squires. We're coming to you from Radnor Studio 21 in beautiful downtown Wayne. And we are now broadcasting into Lower Murray and over Comcast, as well as Verizon. And always in Radnor, both Comcast and Verizon have been <coughs> carrying us. So we're very excited about that. And we have somebody, a guest, who's a very important person in the community. He happens to be the president of the statewide Pennsylvania State Education Association, PSCA, is the larger of the two state teacher unions and also attached to the National Education Association. His name is Jerry Oleksiak, and he was just installed as president. Hi, Jerry. How are you, Bonnie? It's great to be here. I have to do truth in advertising. Go ahead. A long time ago, I was for three years the associate executive director of PSCA, mm -hmm. and I loved it. And I still love it, and they do such good work. Tell us about your background, Jerry. I'm a teacher, uh, and I even I've, I've, this is my ninth year now as an officer in PSEA, my first as president, and I still think of myself as a teacher. I actually worked uh, not too far from here. I taught uh, for most of my educational career in the Upper Marion Area School District. And you taught? I was a special education teacher. I Yay. taught. Uh, yeah, I taught kids with learning issues, behavioral issues, uh, great kids, hard workers. I uh, still miss the classroom after all those years, but I'm really excited to be uh, a part of a, a, great, uh, a great organization in PSEA. To say that we live in interesting times is Very putting, interesting times. I don't know how else to describe it, with no budget in sight and with, we won't name the party that has hunkered down and decided they're not, a get, not going to give an inch even if they put nonprofits and vulnerable people in, in harm's way, right? It's two months and, and counting, over two months that uh, we're overdue. Uh, it doesn't look like anything's going to happen anytime soon. And uh, I would agree that there's one party who may be a little more uh, at, at uh, the Let's cause of this. Let's say they're reticent. They are, but there, there are also a lot of uh, really uh, good folks on both sides who are trying to get this done. Um, I'm hopeful that, that something positive will happen. The governor uh, was elected <coughs> with a very clear mandate uh, to restore the cuts that uh, public education suffered, to uh, work for a tax on Mar Marcel Shale, to do property tax reform. And these are all things that he put forward in his budget. Um, I'm hoping that um, he doesn't have to concede too much to, to get those things that he wants. We have, in our viewing area, we have some really terrific people who are pushing to restore education funding, yeah. to restore funding for special needs population, mm -hmm. to push the tax on Marcella Shale. Are we the only state in the nation that does not tax Marcella Shale? We are the only state in the nation that doesn't tax Marcella Shale. We, uh, we're talking about states like Texas, West Virginia, that do tax the extraction of Marcella Shale. Pennsylvania has not. It's a it's a tremendous resource that uh, belongs to the people, and the people are not getting the benefit from that resource that, that they should be. And education is exactly where that needs to go. Um, right now, and this is something that we should not be proud of, Pennsylvania ranks uh, 45th out of 50 states in the amount of state support it gives to public schools. Uh, and we ranked 50th at the support we give to the neediest schools. So we are dead last across the country. Uh, part of that is, a lot of that is a result of the cuts that we experienced over the last four years. Um, this governor is trying to restore those cuts in a, in a hurry, which is what, what we need because our kids are in <coughs> classes right now, today. Yeah. Uh, and um, our teachers and our communities and our kids particularly see the effects of those cuts. Um, so we, we need a fair and equitable and reliable and sustainable funding formula. We're one of the few states in, in America that doesn't have a funding formula. It's we've, got, we've got good people like State Senator Dale and Leach. Terrific guy. Like State Representative Jim Roebuck, mm -hmm. who's on the House Education yeah. Committee. And on the opposite side, we've got guys like Representative Tom Mert, <coughs> who happens to be a Republican, right. who was always pushing for education funding, for mm -hmm. funding for vulnerable populations. But he gets and shouted down in his caucus. He does. Uh, and Representative DiGirolamo, Gene DiGirolamo, right? is another strong Republican voice uh, in uh, working with Representative Mert on those same issues. But they are, it is an uphill battle for them in the caucus. The, uh, 
uh, voters of Pennsylvania voted for a relatively or very progressive governor in Governor Wolf, but the House and Senate have become um, more regressive, more uh, radicalized. And it's, a, it's very difficult to get things done there. And the uh, governor, I think, is doing all he can to and do what he told the people of Pennsylvania he wanted to do and, and what, what they, they elected him to they do. They elected him exactly. to do that, exactly. Yes. This funding formula for public education, describe what that is and how come we don't have one? Well, it would just, it would, it would create a certain set of criteria that uh, based on how districts met those criteria, that's the funding they would get. Uh, right now, it's, it's, I'm not sure, sure how it's decided. I think it's decided in, in back rooms in Harrisburg. I uh, think it's like bingo and they just pull numbers out of a bowl. Right. And there was, a, <laughs> there was an attempt under the Rendell administration, uh, not an attempt, we had a funding formula that went away under the previous administration and uh, Governor uh, Wolf wants to restore that. Um, we need it. It, it. To be one of the few states that doesn't have it and to rank near the bottom in funding our schools, particularly our neediest schools, that's not what that's not what Pennsylvania is all about. And it's interesting because if you look back at the history, uh, Senator Casey, when I was at PSEA, uh, Casey that first year put twenty million dollars extra money into funding for rural and poor mm -hmm. schools, urban mm -hmm. poor schools and rural schools. That's the first time, probably the last time in history that ever happened. Well, as that, a matter that's of fact. part of what the funding formula would address. It would yeah. take into account rural schools, urban schools, um, English language learners, uh, uh, and we have free more. and reduced lunch. All those categories would, would be a, a part of it, uh, and we don't we don't have that right now. And we have more and more immigrants that are coming into Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. There are certain school districts where nobody speaks English. <laughs> they speak Spanish. Uh, there was, uh, I saw somewhere, I think it was Upper Darby, where there are 47 different languages spoken in the high school by the students there. Wow. So it's, uh, don't quote me on that, okay. <laughs> I, I, but I think a that's A lot right. of different languages. A lot of different languages. Um, and and th again, these are, these are great kids who are there right now, and their needs are immediate. And our, our teachers and our support professionals are, are doing a great job under some very difficult circumstances in, in some of those schools to meet the needs of those kids. I was out at uh, Chester Upland last week where uh, the teachers... Talk about a challenge. The teachers and support professionals there voted to continue working even when they were unsure if they were going to get paid. Now, it turns out they fortunately did get paid, but they only, they only know that there's enough money for two paychecks, this one and their next paycheck. They're ready to work for free because of their commitment to the, the kids of that community. But what, what does that say about us as a society where we have public school uh, employees who don't know if they're going to get paid or not for the ser great services they are providing? And it, it's, it's, it's a, a, a crapshoot whether or not it's, it's, it's the money's going to be there. It's very interesting, some of the points that you just brought up, because every time I hear people start to criticize teachers and teacher unions. Mm -hmm. I say to them, there has to be an easier way to make a living than to be locked in a room with 30 kids, mm -hmm. somebody else's children, all day long. What are you talking about? They only do it because they love teaching right. and they love kids. Right. I'm, I used to, when I first started teaching, my dad would was a hardworking union member, worked for uh, the Bud Company Manufacturing, and was a UAW member. And he would say to me, oh, that's real work. You know, you're hanging out with kids. And I, I remember saying to him once, Dad, how about I'll go to work at UAW or Bud's for a week, and I'll lock you in the room with uh, 30 12-year-olds for a week, and we'll see who's more tired on Friday. And he kind of thought about it, and, and it, it started to change his thinking some. But it, it, is, it is something that we, we do because we love it. We love the kids. We, love the, we care about our communities. Our, our members volunteer in the communities. They're... They're the people sitting next to you in your house of worship. They're standing next to you at the soccer game. They're in line behind you in the supermarket. They're members of the community who care very much about what they do. And um, clearly the folks in Chester Upland have demonstrated that better than anyone could. And a lot of teachers have a second job so they can afford mm -hmm. to be a school teacher mm -hmm. because they're not making what a CEO makes. Right. They're not making, you know, what people in for-profit areas mm -hmm. make. That's correct. And even with I me, mean, the salaries have improved. Uh, 
from when uh, I started teaching, certainly. Oh, I remember uh, when I started teaching yes. in 1962 out of Penn, I got paid $4,000 for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And that's because they gave me like a $200 bump because I'd been a counselor at summer camp. <clears throat> Otherwise, I, I would have gotten yeah, thirty. I, I did a little better. I was, a, I was at 8400 when I started. But oh, wow. It, uh, and they paid still... men more. When I was at Yaden, yes, they, they paid the men more. Their, th their mm -hmm. feeling was, well, the man supporting a family. Right. In the meantime, half of the women teachers at Yaden were putting their husbands through med school mm -hmm. or graduate school. So they were the primary breadwinner, and they were getting paid and a that, lot less. That's one of the things that uh, unions, our union has helped to, to correct. Right. But uh, even with the, the improvement in salaries, as, as we've seen, uh, we still lag behind other professions with equal uh, educational levels, equal hours of work. That's, uh, that's not always an easy thing to convince people of, but that's what the research says, that's what the facts say. Uh, our, our folks work very hard and they're very dedicated to what they do. Let's talk about Jerry Oleksiak. Where did you go to undergraduate school? Do you have any graduate credits? I, I grew up in uh, Philadelphia and I went to a, a Catholic school in the city. I went to St. Joe's College at the time. St. Joseph's University and, and, which now. Which is now St. Joe's University, St. Joseph's University. So. Uh, I, I kid people, I'm a Jesuit trained scholar and you know, we can't have too many of those in our building. We, we have quite a few actually, <laughs> uh, graduates of St. Joe's and other Jesuit schools. But uh, um, I uh, started teaching for the Archdiocese, but it, about the first 10 years I taught, but for the, the rest of my career it was uh, in public education and, and I really loved it. And I think some of the, the, the values I learned in, in uh, college uh, as far as commitment to others, service, for the, working for the greater good. There are things that I, I brought with me to the classroom and I really believe in that. And I believe in that as part of my union work as well. But you have to have graduate credits right, I, in order to continue teaching. So where did you do your graduate work? I did, work? did that at St. Joe's as well. Uh, when you got my, a master's? got a master's degree in education. Uh, my undergrad was in international relations. I always wanted to teach oh. history, economics, political science. I ended up teaching special education. I. I uh, Tell my used to tell my students, and I would tell my own children. Sometimes uh, you don't choose the path; the path chooses you. And I was uh, fortunate to have some opportunities and got my special ed cert, uh, certification. And I loved that work. I loved working with those kids. Uh, the more challenging, what, the better. What kind of disabilities did <clears throat> the students have that you were teaching? Uh, when I worked in, in Philadelphia for the Archdiocese, I worked with kids who were uh, uh, court adjudicated. All came through family court. And what does that age. mean? They were delinquent kids. Uh, had run in oh. uh, trouble with the law, uh, and ha some of them were minor offenses, some were relatively uh, uh, more serious. But m when I moved into the public schools, I worked primarily with kids with um, social issues, emotional issues, behavioral issues. Intellectual disability? Some of that, but, but not as much. Oh, uh, that's interesting. It was interesting. mostly kids with the, the uh, emotional and behavioral issues. And uh, some of them were, I think they were smarter than me. They, they were. They were very bright kids. Uh, it was just a matter of finding uh, what would work with them. Every day was a challenge. Every, every class was a challenge. Something that would work in the morning wouldn't work in the afternoon. Something that worked today wouldn't work tomorrow. So it was constantly uh, adjusting, monitoring uh, what was going on, challenging the kids, challenging yourself. So it, it, was, uh, it was great experience, uh, great background for working in Harrisburg now. I know that. What was the grade level that they had you teaching these kids at? Mostly middle school level, which is challenging enough. And then I- Oh, I the hormones the, are popping. Oh my. The, it's an adventure. Every day was an adventure <laughs> at the middle school. And, and I, again, I loved it. I loved the challenge. I loved the, I tell people, I think I'm the only teacher in America that loved bus duty in the morning because I love seeing the kids come into the building. It was, it looked like America. They were, you know, they were all races and religions and kids in wheelchairs and, and kids in turbans and kids speaking different languages and this was at Upper Marion yes yes which is you know people think of it as a relatively uh, yeah the know, white bread uh, yeah exactly <laughs> but it's not and, and 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 that's how a lot of our schools are uh, and even Lower Marion where, where we are in Radnor there's a yeah uh, public education reflects America uh, we are I, I think we're the most democratic the small d democratic open uh, institution in in the country Public education, you know, I was at a conference recently that was sponsored by a major law firm in Philadelphia, but it was devoted to charter schools. Now, Representative Jim Roebuck, who is a good friend mm -hmm. of mine, 
he has a different view of charter schools than the people who were congregated for that particular seminar. And they couldn't answer some of the questions that I asked. I mean, they spoke, but they didn't answer the questions. And several people came up to me afterwards and said, you asked the best questions, Bonnie, but they didn't answer your questions no. because I wanted to know. They kept talking about parent involvement, which is a requirement for charter school in order to get the charter. But I, asked, I raised my hand and I said, you're just assuming that every kid that's in a Philadelphia charter school has parents that will come and be involved. What happens to the kids that don't have parents? How did they get into the charter school? Who filed for them? You know, who made the application? They had various, you know, answers that were unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. And then I asked them, said, because the charter schools are public schools that use taxpayer money, is it okay for people who own charter schools to make a profit? They were very, the lawyers were very quick to assure me that they didn't make a profit. They may keep some money in reserve for a rainy day fund, for emergency, whatever. And then one of the attorneys who's in the process of applying to own a charter school said, muttered something about, well, we're not giving any money back to the state. Ah. So. Right, and, and uh, charters, uh, the little history lesson, and I'm sure you're aware of this, charters initially were a, a, a union idea. It came from uh, Al Shanker in New York, and the idea was to, who was the head of the uh, Federation in New York. And American the Federation of Teachers, teachers correct. AFT. AFT, our, our fellow, uh, our colleagues in, in education in Pennsylvania. But uh, it, was, it was an idea that uh, let's see if we can create little laboratories to see what will work, what we can transfer uh, to public schools. They were not designed for profit. Uh, what's happening now, uh, they're still public schools, but they are, the, it's the, a public entity that grants the charter, but they can be managed by for-profit companies, and that's what's happening. They, there are companies making a lot of money, a lot lots of money. of money, in, a lot uh, of scandals too, unfortunately. Right. And not just in Pennsylvania. All, Ohio's oh. been rocked by it. Uh, Florida, there's a lot of, of scandal that's uh, uh, related to charter schools. That, to be fair, some of them, uh, some of them are, are, wonderful. are fine and do well, and we, we represent members in charter schools. Um, but they don't have to hire people they, who are union members or who have been certified by PSCA, for example. Right, Well, they or, or the state. They don't have to yeah. hire, uh, uh, they're allowed a certain percentage, I think it's 25% of their staff does not need to have teaching credentials. So um, we're working very hard in Washington, in, in, in Washington, but also in Harrisburg, to uh, change the charter laws, to um, make them more accountable for the money they spend, for the results they get, for what they do with the, their uh, special needs kids, for oh, that's what they another do question with the testing. That's another question I asked. I said, you say that they're not selective and they take everybody. I said, but that's I hear true. from many families that have a child with an intellectual disability that the charter school will say, well, we don't have the equipment, we don't have the personnel, therefore we can't service, we can't accept your child. Mm -hmm. The, the opposite also happens where they'll, they'll take a student who may not be a special needs student, but then they'll evaluate that student and all of a sudden they are. And they and get they more money. they get more money for it. So that it, it's, it works both ways and it really isn't, it's a, an abomination. It shouldn't happen. Uh, so we really need to, uh, as, a, as a state and our, our legislators need to address the, those issues as part of the issue in Chester Upland. Yeah, well, but the headlines it seems as if every week there's a new scandal mm -hmm. with charter schools. Mm -hmm. And just what you pointed out, that they'll accept students and then evaluate them after they've accepted them as special needs. But it's something that's such a minor special need, but they get the, they same, get the same amount of money, same amount of money <coughs> that <coughs> as, with school, the students with more as a student right. with intellect, severe intellectual mm -hmm. disability that has a feeding tube, that's mm -hmm. uh, in a wheelchair, right. that's nonverbal, mm -hmm. that really is a special and needs those, student. And those kids are in our schools, and we're, we're happy to have them. We, we, yeah. That's part of what I, what I meant when I said America, or um, public schools are, are one of the most democratic institutions in America. We take everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and are happy to do it. And you can't throw them out. I think the charter schools, the one thing that Representative Roebuck often says is parents think that that the charter school is a safer environment 
for their kids because they don't take everybody and right. they can throw out anybody who's right. a problem. Is right. that accurate? That, that is accurate. And uh, I know we, we, I used to say when I was in the classroom, there's no such place as away. You can't put kids away. They have to be someplace. Yeah. And, um, they, and, and every child, is in, uh, particularly special needs kids, are entitled to a free, appropriate public education. Um, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't always work with charter schools. They, they can be very selective. They can be, uh, uh, you know, a lot of their statistics they don't need to share. There's a lot of issues related to charters that we'd like to see fix. fixed. What is your goal uh, or the issue you're going to be working on for the next couple of years during your first term as president of BSCA? Well, I think the, the, the biggest goal for me is we, we have been under, we educators, public school educators, uh, union members, have been under constant attack uh, in Pennsylvania and, and nationwide. And I, and I joke sometimes, I miss the memo. I, I miss that, that point where we went from being dedicated public servants to being these greedy, union thug, uh, <laughs> aggressive, you know, I, I'm the same person I was when I started, I think. But um, I would like to, to work with the governor and other, other labor organizations to change the tone, to change the, the tenor of the dialogue that we have, that uh, we're not bad guys, we're not bad women, we're not, we're not greedy, we're not uh, union goons. I, I'm a special ed teacher. I, uh, I remind You're people that all the soul, time. You're a gentle soul, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I don't know if everybody would say that, but I, I, I think I am, and, and I, I, I brought that to the classroom. And I, uh, but I'm also resolute. I know, I know what I believe in. I know what's right. I'm willing to fight for that. Our union is willing to fight for that. Um, so I, I guess changing that, 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 the dialogue that we're having uh, and, and doing practical things like I'd love to leave uh, office with a funding formula in place that we've created in Harrisburg where uh, charter school, um, the, the issues we talked about with charters have been corrected, uh, where um, uh, our, our rights as, as professionals, our collective bargaining rights are not under attack, uh, or just even our right to organize or our right to collect dues. All these things are, are literally being attacked. And uh, there have been successful attacks in other states around the country, Wisconsin, Michigan, yes, Ohio. Yes, Scott Walker. Oh. Mm. And we have, been, we have been very fortunate in Pennsylvania because we, we do have strong alliances with other labor groups, public sector and private sector uh, unions. And under uh, other Republican governors, like um, Governor Ridge, I mean, he, he was a good friend to public education. He, Absolutely. Well, he and and he got it. He, he went. He wanted vouchers. When vouchers didn't were defeated, okay, they were that defeated. That was the end of it. Uh, now we, we <coughs> joke it. They're they're like zombies. Uh, <laughs> they just keep coming back with the same bad ideas, and we have to we have to uh, keep fighting them. Uh, the, our pension is is another one. Our retirement right. security. Uh, our members have paid seven and a half percent into the pension system from the Forever. time they started uh, from their very first paycheck and the state took a very long holiday and now when the market went bad in 08. Oh, explain what that means the state took a long holiday. Well um, <laughs> the the public school employee retirement system is funded uh, the the money comes goes in from the uh, em employee the, the worker the school district and the state. And we put in seven and a half percent and the state and the district used to split what's called the normal cost so that they were, the system was sustainable. And at some years, they, the, the cost to the system, to the districts in the states were so low that they didn't put literally nothing some years or very little. Um, and that was okay when the market was, was doing fine, but when the, the market uh, Took a tumble. had its issues, uh, then all of a sudden, it, there's a shortfall and people are saying oh there's a crisis well there there's a there's a a funding crisis it's not a the system isn't isn't the system is strong when it's nurtured and taken care of and that's what we're another thing I'd like to see uh, that we we stabilize the pension system that, and that's one of the <coughs> things that Governor Wolf is trying to do in this budget and there are some people who ideologically are opposed to the fact that public sector employees have a defined benefit pension system I, I, where they know what their pension is going to be. And, uh, that would be nice. It would be nice for all <laughs> Americans if, if exactly. that retirement security existed. It's, it doesn't benefit anyone when uh, 
people who are ready to retire don't know what money they have to retire on or uh, how long it's going to last or what they're going to do. That, um, particularly in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania has, I think it's the second or third oldest population in the country because people who retire here stay, stay here. here. And they spend that pension money here. Uh, there's a group uh, I, I've heard of where I used to teach, they call themselves Romeo, Retired Old Men Eating Out. <laughs> and they, they meet regularly at some I local love diner. It. Romeo. Romeo, the retired old man eating out. And they, they have a nice breakfast. They may, maybe they'll play golf, but that's all money they're putting into the local economy. When, you know, that's true. And that's what uh, our retirees do. And, and it helps the state of Pennsylvania. Well, when you look into the future, if you had a crystal ball, what do you see will be? the best thing that's going to happen in the next couple of years and what do you think is the scariest possibility? Well, I think the scariest possibility is if the attacks on, on teachers in particular and, and public school employees and, and all public sector employees continues. It, it, mm. it, it devalues the, the work that, that government does, it devalues the work that public employees do and it, it it takes us away from the common good. It takes us away from the social contract. And that's a very uh, troubling thing. If we all start thinking we can do it all on our own, we can't all do it on our own. We need each other. We need government. We need public services to, to be a civilized society. So I, if those attacks continue, if that breakdown of the common, the social contract, the common good continues, then I think we're in, in, in serious trouble. If we can change the tone of the dialogue, if we can um, bring back civility, bring back civility, uh, that would be very go, nice. Go back to a time. Well, not go back to a time, but create a time where, where uh, there is respect. Uh, people are yes. treated with dignity. People are, are are free to, you know, to make their own choices about things. People don't have to. Um, I don't. Well, I don't. We don't have to deal with people like Kim Davis, I'll put it that way. You know, no. the, the woman uh, that's, that's but, using her government position for oh, religious purposes. Oh, that please. kind of thing is just... Please, just separation of church and state has always been something that PSEA has valued mm -hmm. and has worked to maintain. Very Absolutely. Much. And this is coming from somebody who <laughs> raised Catholic, went to Catholic school, right, sang right, in my right, church right, choir. Right, right. I believe in, a, in, in that, that separation. But it, it's that, that, that whole uh, sense of... Uh, uh, that government is the problem. It, it's not the problem. No. It's part of the solution. Absolutely part of the solution. And there's so many things that only government can accomplish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's going to build roads? Mm -hmm. Who's going to build bridges? And who's, who's going to, who's gonna, well, I don't mean to interrupt, but who, who's going to educate our children if, right, if it exactly. becomes a, a for-profit uh, uh, operation? When, when you're not making money, what do you do? You shut it down. <laughs> and again, there's no such place as a way. Those students have to go someplace, and, and they, that has to be to the public schools. Absolutely. So we need to invest in what's going to matter for our, our future and education is the best investment you can make. And PSEA is always at the forefront of speaking out op-eds, letters to the editor, appearing mm -hmm. on television shows mm -hmm. and putting out the gospel. Pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> well we, we believe in, 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 in what we do as, as professionals. Right. We believe in our communities and we believe in our kids. We believe in public education as a real value to the society and we will fight for that. Our guest today has been Jerry Oleksiak, the newly anointed president <laughs> of the PSEA, the Pennsylvania State Education Association. Thank you, Jerry, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate the time.